Hi, this is Jay Warner Wallace. If you're a fan of clear thinking and of being able to make the case for what you believe as a Christian, to be able to make the case for truth, well, this is a great place to learn how to do that. This is Deeper Waters with Nick Peters. Nick has a number of great guests on his show, and I've been just honored to be one of those guests. So if you want to carve some time to be able to become a better Christian case maker, this is the way to do it right here at Deeper Waters with Nick Peters. You stand on the shore of the ocean watching the tide come in. You sense the call of the sea beckoning to take you further. You step forward little by little, not knowing what to expect, but expecting more. You keep going as the ocean calls, calls you to enter in to deep waters. Welcome to the Deeper Waters Podcast. I'm Nick Peters, your host, seeing to bring you the very best in Christian scholarship and apologetics. And today is no exception. We've got two people here online ready to talk with us, and our topic is going to be Jehovah's Witnesses. The first one I'm going to introduce is someone who is not a stranger to the show. I believe this is the third time he's been on. And that's uh, Dr. Rob Bowman. Junior. He served since 2008 as the Executive Director at the Institute for Religious Research, which is based in Cedar Springs, Michigan. The organization's website is irr.org. Rob has lectured on biblical studies, religion, and apologetics at Biola University, Cornerstone University, and New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. He is the author of over 60 articles and, a co-author, and the author or co-author of 13 books, including Putting Jesus in His Place, The Case for the Deity of Christ, co-authored of J. Ed Komazewski, and Faith Has Its Reasons, Integrative Approaches to Defending the Christian Faith. Co-author with Kenneth D. Boa, he holds the MA and PhD degrees in Biblical Studies from Florida Theological Seminary and South African Theological Seminary. So, uh, Rob, Dr. Bowman, welcome back to the podcast. Glad to be back. Mm -hmm. So, tell us a little bit about how you got to be doing what you're doing here. (laughs) Well, that takes us back quite a ways because uh, we'd have to go back about 40 years almost. Uh, It would be about 40 years. When I was a very young Christian and still uh, a teenager, barely, uh, I uh, encountered some Jehovah's Witnesses that had come to our door. And uh, interesting enough, uh, I actually had to run up the street to talk to them because my mother had sent them away and I wanted to talk to them. And so we started talking on the street corner and a a crowd gathered around. There all the Jehovah's Witnesses that were canvassing the neighborhood came up to the street corner and here I am talking with all these people. And I ended up meeting with a older Jehovah's Witness couple for three months and they did their best to convert me and they were pretty good. But, uh, uh, I was really focused on what does the Bible teach on these things, and I kept studying the Bible, and uh, that kind of catapulted me into this whole field of dealing with uh, various religious groups that claim to restore true biblical doctrine, uh, that claim that Orthodox Christianity is not biblical, not reasonable, and not believable, and to deal with how they interpret Scripture. And in fact, that's really my area of academic mm-hmm. expertise is in the biblical studies field, especially hermeneutics. And I try to apply those uh, studies uh, to groups like Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormonism, uh, Unitarianism, and uh, other groups of that nature. Mm-hmm. So that's basically what I've been doing now for cl- pretty close to 40 years. Now, I'm curious, when you went chasing after these witnesses, did you have a strong biblical background? Like you would be able to defend what you believe at the time or now, or what? Well, it was pretty much in the preliminary stages of development. I was only about 19, and I hadn't been a Christian more than, I don't know, a year and a half or something. And I hadn't studied the biblical languages yet, although I had begun looking at those, but I hadn't actually studied them yet. And so it, it was it was pretty early in the process, and I really got a biblical education in a hurry by necessity because Mm -hmm. I really needed to understand what Scripture said on these things. And I wasn't 
willing to settle for pad answers or recycled answers. And I caused a little bit of uh, consternation at my church because uh, uh, I wasn't willing to just uh, uncritically accept their word that the Jehovah's Witnesses were wrong. I needed to know for myself. I needed mm-hmm. to have answers to their arguments. And uh, so I, I went through a period where I really wasn't sure who had the truth. And unfortunately, some of the people at my church weren't very helpful. Uh, some of the adults uh, were basically discouraging me from uh, wrestling with these issues or giving me bad information, such as asserting that Jesus was the Father, which I, even I knew that wasn't right. <laughs> so uh, it, it was a struggle. It was a process. And it really reinforced uh, in my uh, understanding the, the importance of Christians studying the Bible. We, we don't do that enough. Uh, we need to know our Bibles, and we need to understand them uh, much more uh, thoroughly than most Christians today do. And that's really one of my passions, is just helping Christians to understand Scripture. Yeah, I, I hate to say it, but all the things you're telling me about going wrong at your church over time, I wasn't surprised a bit to hear any of it. It just seemed like part of the course. I'm afraid so. Now, our other guest joining us today is someone who just recently came out of the Jehovah's Witnesses. His name is Sean Kalaki. He's a member of a church of a Nazarene. He's a student at Northwest Nazarene University starting late August and will be studying philosophy and Christian theology there. He has a forthcoming essay, The Three-Legged Stewart, Witness, Particularism's Faulty Foundation, in Don Vaynott's Midwest Christian Outreach Journal. So, um, Sean, welcome to the Deeper Waters podcast. Well, thanks for having me. Now, tell us a bit about how you came to get to be where you are today. And like I said earlier, Dr. Bowman, if you have any questions you want to ask him, meanwhile, feel free to jump in and ask away. But, Sean? Um, you me, I'll, I'll, if you fine with you, I'll start a little bit. I'll do a brief overview of like my life as a witness, how that led into this. Sure. Um, Okay, so, you know, I, I was raised as one of Jehovah's Witnesses by my uh, my parents. My mom converted later on, but my dad also was raised. And my family's involvement with Witnesses on my dad's side goes back to the 60s. And so I'm, you know, fourth generation. And so I was pretty pretty zealous Witness. I'm like, the, I was a kid uh, who in elementary school. Like, you know, I'd, I'd research on Watchtower Library, a program they have, and all their articles, and bring them to, you know, people at school. I was really involved in that. And, uh, and from, like, early age, as I just said, and it continued into uh, you know middle school and high school, uh, but partially what helped me with do this research is was I I cared more about what was said than who said it and what the arguments were with rather than you know the you know the supposed authority of the people who said it uh, you know you know so this is you know somewhat odd I'm doing all this research on Watchtower Library and it's you know kind of detaching me from dependency on the organization as witnesses call their uh, group. Mm-hmm. Um, and in this regard, I think it you know illustrates uh, something that uh, Rob, you said. Let me j- I pulled it up here just a second ago. Uh, here we go. I'm gonna pull it up here. Oh, where did we go? Okay. All right. You, you said something on one of your articles on your uh, your website. It says if a witness claims to believe that he can defend his understanding of the Bible just fine without appealing to the interpretive authority of the Watchtower, we should encourage that belief. Reading the Bible without constantly deferring to the interpretation of the Watchtower Society has often proved to be the road of emancipation from the religion of the Jehovah's Witnesses. And I think that, yeah, that's very much true in my case because I said I, I didn't care so much who was saying these arguments about the Trinity and you know the soul and hell and cross and all these you know supposedly pagan things, right? I just cared about what they said. I just hadn't had a chance to come across, you know, uh, you know, countering counter evidence. But, this, but when I began to, in about 2015, I was doing research on biblical contradictions. You know, I, I, either I was bothered by them or I was just interested by them. You know, for that great portion of that year, I began studying these. And so you have to go online to get lists of those. But I also came across some uh, evangelicals who were you know, who had interest in that as well, including, I, I believe he's a, you're a ministry partner, Nick, uh, J.P. Holding, is that right? Yep, yep. Yeah, and so he has, he actually, he still has doing some uh, work on that, but he, back then he also had some material on biblical contradictions. And, you know, so I read that, and I thought, he, he you know, he first of all, he's taken the Bible seriously, That's a that was a good impression, and it's only one that was reinforced as I did more reading uh, from him and others. And uh, I also read some other stuff he had because I thought he was reasonable on these points. You know, I, I was willing to try him out a little bit on like the Trinity, the soul, hell, those kinds of things. I, I, I didn't, you know, instantly convert like, oh, that 
accept that now. But it was, you know, in the back of my mind, I was considering it. Uh, and then I did more research. Uh, I shifted over to the Trinity because, you know, that was, I, I've been interested in the Trinity for years, like since I was like a real little kid. I'm not saying I understood it well, I didn't. But I began to understand it a little better. I began to distinguish it from modalism, which is what, you know, what most witnesses think is the Trinity is actually more modalistic. I didn't, I didn't, my grasp wasn't perfect just yet, but I began to see some of the things I thought it said, it didn't say. And some of the things it said, those don't seem too unreasonable. You know, maybe they're wrong. I, I didn't know at the point. I, I hadn't believed it yet, but, you know, that began transitioning, uh, transitioning uh, me toward believing in the Trinity, which, of course, I, I do now. Uh, and basically, it was, you know, it's really indirect. All these things began to converge in various interests. In 2016, I began studying abortion. I was reading, like, you know, Francis Beckwith and, and those guys. And it began ask, making ask, well, what is a human person? And so I began to believe, well, we have a soul. And also, I was interested in arguments for God's existence. And that helped uh, refine my conception of God. Uh, in addition to denying the Trinity, witnesses also think God's uh, corporeal, which I think it, the implication of that is not appreciated enough by uh, many who argue against uh, witnesses. But, you know, as I, I said, oh, he's not corporeal, and which has important implications, I think, for the Trinity and helped me accept that. And he's also, you know, on, on the present, timeless, and, and so forth. Uh, and then and this one thing is really, from a personal or, you know, like existential perspective, was really important. Uh, I, when I was studying arguments for Jesus' resurrection, I came across the idea he was raised a human being. And, you know, I th first I thought that was kind of funny because, you know, well, how could you know, cause witnesses don't believe that? But then I realized, no, he, he was. Acts 2, 13, the Gospels, it's all it's consistent. His body was the same, but was changed. It's still human. And that undermined the, the witness doctrine. It, it's not their official name for it, but the two classes doctrine, that there's a, you know, there's the anointed and they're the only ones who are born again. And they're the only ones in the new covenant. Everyone else is under it. Only they get to go to heaven and reign with Christ and be with him. Well, you know, a lot of witnesses, I guess, are happy, you know, not going to heaven, you know, because in heaven and earth and witness thought is rigidly separated. You're in heaven, you're, you might maybe visit the earth every once in a while, but you're going to be in heaven all the time. And if you're on earth, you can't go to heaven. There's, you're not going to be cut out from that regard. And the more I realized, well, no, wait, wait, if Jesus was raised human and the righteous will be raised up like Jesus, there can't well, what's the basis for these, the two groups, the two class doctrine, is it? That's, you know, that's very good. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, and and, and 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 moreover, I was also reading. It, it wasn't like a Randy Alcorn's book on heaven, but it was you know some of that kind of material. And I was realizing, I guess the technical term, you know, the beatific vision, or the one I like most is the happifying sight to be united with God. And well, witnesses, their conception of eternal life is you know missing that. And so more and more from an existential perspective, and also for the importance of worship as that relates to the doctrine of the Trinity. You know, I was being, you know, squeezed from, I guess, both those sides. And increasingly, I was, you know, finding myself unhappy, you know, worshiping as a Jehovah's Witness. And more and more, I, my, and this whole process, you know, my appraisal of Jehovah's Witnesses went, we're the, we're the truth. And we're the best. You know, we're one of the best. We're okay, you know, so forth. <laughs> and, you know, wow. actually, and, that's, and that's actually one thing that you mentioned earlier. My, my, my essay was on witness particularism. It's actually, that essay is kind of modest. It was just... You know, witnesses aren't the be you know the only genuine Christian because I think that's kind of like the uh, you put like a you know like a, a hill you put like a little uh, you know snowball on a hill and it rolls down it gets bigger and bigger it's only it's only a matter of time really you know until it devolves you're like well I can't worship the Father and Spirit and truth here mm -hmm. um, and I suppose the two two other lessons are, they're related and you can maybe ask more questions about this in particular is in addition to the one I mentioned uh, what, what Rob said. Two things that made the most difference, more than any specific argument or question or scriptural citation or whatever, was that I could see people like, you know, J.P. Holding, William Craig, you, Nick, all the people I was reading, they took scripture seriously. And because yeah, witnesses think, you know, only they do, right? You know, everyone else is just making all these pagan doctrines up, you know, because you know, who, who knows why they do that. But that's uh, what witnesses think. But I was seeing, you know, these people take you know, scripture seriously, and it gave me a a twofold effect. It gave me, you know, pause, and you know, I, I took these questions and arguments and you know, scriptural citations more seriously because of that. And also, I began to develop a kind of affinity with the authors I was reading. You know, ultimately looking back in a rivalry with that I had for you know the uh, the you know the Watchtower and Awake and all those. Uh, you know, 
And so more and more, I thought, you know, the Watchtower, I can understand why somebody, if they only read that, that kind of stuff like I did when I was growing up, why you think it's reasonable. You know, even Scripture itself says, you know, whoever states their case first seems right until someone else cross-examines them. And so I was beginning this affinity for other, you know, other writers. And related to that, but I could see, you know, people like you, like if anyone reads your blog, Nick, you say, you know, you take a biblical morality, you know, very seriously. You know, you're not like, a, you don't fall for the air of like, you know, the Westboro Baptist Church and everyone's, you know, mm-hmm. hate everything. But you take it seriously. You no know, witnesses, at least this much, you know, you can just, they, they have their own problems in this regard, but they do take it more seriously than, you know, many others. And so as a witness, like if I hear about, you know, the, what's going on in the Episcopal Church or, you know, all these, you know, odd, you know, very, you know, sad things, witnesses tend to lump them all together any professed christian group they're all one monolith and the errors of these groups are, is everyone's there and you know if they can't get these simple things right like you know you know like you will you know you know fornication is bad if they can't get that right you know they don't have any truth in them but fortunately i was able to see past that partially because i could see you know people like uh, like you uh, william craig and so forth took biblical morality seriously and so i say you know what well, we're not you know that far not the only one. That's why it was, you know, we're from the best to we're in the best, and then, you know, downhill as that went on. Um, um, do you want me to go in now, or specifically about how I changed my mind about the Trinity? Because uh, that one, I think, is somewhat interesting. Uh, let me just ask some things at first here. I, I'm kind of curious. When you came across people like myself, J.P. Hoeing, William Lane Craig, others and such, were you kind of thinking, gosh, these guys... They really do know their stuff, but it's it's just such a shame they haven't seen that the Trinity is such a lie. Was there anything like oh, that going on? Oh, yeah, at first I did. Um, in fact, in 2015, I wrote a, a, bo- a booklet of the Trinity, and I am like, oh, man, William Craig is pretty, you know, pretty smart, but and Trinity, what is he what talking about? You know, Jesus is God. What kind of nonsense is that? Oh, well, you know, what a shame, you know, because I thought I had it all figured out. But, yeah, and so I did at first, but I was, you know, I guess I was a bit somewhat skeptical of myself, like, you know, hear him out. Before before you reject it, you know, hear it out. Because I, I was, because I, I quickly realized my understanding of the Trinity wasn't so good. Like when I, I remember when I read, I can't remember who, who I read it in, but who said that, you know, Jesus is now a glorified human. I said, what? Trinitarians believe that? I to my, I guess I missed that out. I never, I never uh, grasped that. Uh, and so that you know, that kind of gave me pause, though, and so that I thought to myself, you know, maybe I don't have everything figured out. But I still kind of figured out these guys. Trinity, what a joke, you know. But, you know, that was, you know, hey, yeah, you have, sometimes it takes a while to you uh, learn, I guess, until you learn in your mm-hmm. mistakes. Uh, Dr. Bowman, is this the first time you've heard Sean's story? It is. And, Sean, I'm interested by your story because it seems to be – a little bit out of the ordinary for the typical story of a former Jehovah's Witness uh, who becomes a, a, a Bible-believing Christian. Uh, the the usual experiences that I've heard, uh, the individual is not uh, really looking to uh, sort out uh, doctrinal issues. He's not listening to and reading evangelical writers, but rather he's he's experienced some disillusionment with the organization. It's uh, legalism or it's uh, it's man-made rules, and he's uh, uh, he's finding it uh, you know really difficult to accept the kind of uh, uh, authoritarian. Uh, style of the organization, and he comes to an appreciation of grace and forgiveness and mercy in Christ, and eventually uh, starts rethinking some of the theological issues. Uh, mm-hmm. But he doesn't really start doing that typically uh, in the stories that I've heard uh, until after he's already come to the conclusion that the organization is not where he's going to find the truth. And uh, but he says, you know, uh, yeah, I, I, I really can't uh, can't give credence to the to the uh, Watchtower any longer. But I don't know what I believe about God and Christ and all that. And they eventually, you know, he eventually figures it out. Uh, but your stories, and I'm not saying you're, you know, it's it's always that way. Obviously, it's not. But yeah. that's been the usual pattern uh, of most of the former Jehovah's Witnesses that I have known or heard their stories. So I, I find your story very interesting. I think it's probably uh, 
something we're going to hear more and more because of the internet, because of yes. the ease with which people can encounter Christian thinkers of different persuasions and different perspectives than the ones that they're uh, being taught in. It's more difficult now to be insulated from that, and that yeah. may be an ex- yeah. this may be a good example of of one of the uh, the effects of that uh, uh, shift in our ways of receiving and processing information. Yeah, um, like I, like you know, some people you mentioned, some people become disillusioned with some you know some series of bad experiences or so forth. And uh, myself, that wasn't so much my ex- my experience. I mean, there were some things I like in my early teens or so I found out you know, some negative material about witnesses some of it kind of backfired though because it was like the kind of you know, some people out there say oh you know witnesses are run by the Illuminati or something and I'm like oh, God. <laughs> oh no there is there's a lot and that's that's what irritates me because first of all if it's true like you're going to persuade some of that sure no it's not true but uh, but there was some stuff that did stick with me and I kind of kind of worried me a little bit like the you know the false prophecies and I, I do believe you know they were false they're false uh, prophecies now but at the time I didn't and so I you know that kind of bothered me though because I never heard of this kind of stuff like 1925 19 1975, well, and there's more dates too. But I never heard of that. But you know, eventually I found some of the standard witness response, which is you know they're not false prophecies; they were just predictions and interpretations we got wrong. And you know that that satisfied me for a time until you know I looked into it in a bit more depth. But of course, even that kind of doesn't get you all the way you want to go if you're a witness, because you still have to admit, oh, we were wrong, and that you know lowers your credibility in interpreting prophecies. And so, in sense, really. Prophecies are like they're raised on detra. I mean, if they claim to fulfill certain prophecies showing, you know, God made them their spokesman and all that, and that gives a lot of credibility, you know, if, if you believe that to what they say. Well, increasingly, I found myself unable to believe things like, you know, like 1914 or like this generation you know, is the one that will see, you know, the end, which is now, you know, it's like two generations now. Yeah. Uh, it, it, will, it, will, it will run out. They'll have, to, they'll have to change that within the next probably 15, 20 years, I'm sure. Uh, but so I, that kind of loaded a little bit, and that really reinforced my, you know, no, I didn't saw, it's reinforced this trend in me. I, I believe they were the truth, you know, it was a bit vague, you know, as I said, it became more vague what I meant by the truth as time went on, because what they said seemed true, like on certain, you know, these doctrines, like Trinity was wrong, of course. Not so much, I didn't believe what they said because they're the truth, you know, prophetically established and all that. I didn't believe that. And so it gave me more freedom to, the reason I believed they were the truth when I did was uh, because it seemed like they were making sense. So I couldn't just beg the question and say, of course this is true because they're the truth. No, because that, that was a conclusion in my thought, not kind of like a assumption I made beforehand. Um, and particularly, and what it enabled me to do, and this is, I think, very crucial, is as it were, separate Jehovah from Jehovah's Witnesses. And so many times if someone is wanting to leave or they're having, you know, really significant doubts and, you know, their friends or the elders or family members are thinking, oh, this guy might be leaving. They'll say, well, you know, you can't turn your back on Jehovah. You know, he gave you all this truth. It's like, well, I'm, I'm doubting that it is true, but, you know, whatever. But I was able to say, no, I'm not turning my back on Jehovah. It's because... I have to serve them in spirit and truth. I have to love them with my whole soul, heart, and mind. And if I can't do that as a witness, well, I can't do that as a witness. It's, it's not up to, you know, I mean, it'd be great if it was the truth, but, you know, it's not. So, and so I was that, able to separate his word Jehovah from Jehovah's Witnesses helped me, you know, avoid any temptation to think, oh, I'm betraying God by, you know, you know, this questioning, you know. Uh, That's a, yeah, such a crucial yeah. distinction because so many people now are coming out of Jehovah's Witness religion and likewise in Mormonism. They're coming out and they're becoming agnostics or skeptics oh, yeah. or atheists because mm-hmm. they really never did get past that equation of Jehovah with Jehovah's Witnesses or equating belief in God with belief in the organization. So since this particular religion didn't pan out, and they were told all other religions are bad, for some reason they concluded, okay, my religion is also bad, so forget all of it. Uh, And that's really a shame, but that's, I think, been the the big trend in the last 20 years or so. It's been increasing that people coming out of these groups uh, become a down on all religion, uh, don't believe in God anymore, don't believe the Bible, uh, and... uh, 
even go to such extremes as buying into the skeptical line that Jesus never existed and things oh, like that. Oh, yeah. Uh, which, uh, you know. It's worth uh, a good it, laugh, I guess. But, uh, yeah. yeah. So it is it is laughable, but unfortunately, uh, it's a product of uh, a really, I think, a kind of bitter antagonism toward Christianity that many people have when they've had a bad experience, like being in a group that claims to be the one true channel of truth and all that, and then it doesn't work out to be yeah. the case. Then they say, well, I, I just don't need religion. So I'm, I'm so glad to hear your story, because I... I I, I kind of get weary of the stories of the ex-Jehovah's Witness or the ex-Mormon or whatever, uh, who, who is just abandoning all faith. And I'm, I'm always glad to hear when people are recognizing that they can, they can, they can uh, conclude that what they were being taught about God and about Christ wasn't true without rejecting God himself. And that, that's just so encouraging. Yeah. You know, I'm saying I'm not sure how it happened. Like you know, somehow early on I was able to escape the everything's pagan. Like you know, I, I it, there's a lot of pagan things in the world, of course, but somehow I was able to to think, well, maybe it's wrong, but maybe it's not pagan, and so it was less you know vile to me, and so I was willing to you know hear it out and say, well, well maybe it's right, you know, you know, I, at this point, who knows? And well, it turns out, well, it is. Uh, and so and I'm not sure how, but it's, it is really sad that many, they still embrace the, like, oh, Constantine, you know, invented Christianity. Maybe they don't say it quite like that, but, you know, something along those lines. And so, you know, I guess there is no Christianity, there's no truth out there. Um, it, it is sad. Mm. Um, so let me ask you a question also, and this one might be painful for you. I don't mean it to be, but how do you, how's your relationship with your family now? Um, it wasn't, it's, keep in mind, of course, most of my witness, the witness family that I'm closest with are on my dad's side, but, uh, it's not as bad as I, as I thought it was. Like I have my, my hello, we, we just lost you, Sean. This will be edited out later, I'm sure. Okay. <laughs> I don't think, know if he knows. Oh, there you are. We oh, lost weird. you for a little bit, Sean. Uh, yeah, that's, that's strange. I, I've been hearing you, so I don't know. Um, oh, you can you both hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay, Sean, my sound guy will edit this out, so I'm going to just start again, <laughs> and you start over again, okay? Sean, okay. This, this might be a question that's painful for you to hear, but I'm, I'm going to ask it anyway, and I don't mean to hurt. But how's your relationship with your family? Um, yeah, well, so my family, my witness family, my uh, dad's side, in some respects, you know, it's like my grandmother. I even, she said, you know, like I was talking to her and she's like, she's like, goodbye. You know, that's, that was kind of, a, you know, sad. And, and my, some of my closest cousins, including one who is an elder, you know, I haven't, you know, talked to them over the phone or, you know, seen them, you know, at all. They, they're in California, so I haven't, you know, seen them. But, and so there, I, 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 I might, so hopefully, you know, I'll be able to restore a relationship with them. So fortunately, I've been somewhat fortunate, like with my aunt, who, who you know, she's like, well, you know, I don't, I don't really, she, she, she's, she's more willing to, you know, break or, you know, flex uh, the rules a bit. And, uh, and so I, I've seen uh, her, and also I had an uncle who, I, I didn't tell him I am just fellowship, I told him, you know, I, I just, I don't believe all these things, you know, I'm going to, you know, go elsewhere. But I was more along the lines of like, well, I'm not going to be officially disfellowship. You know, I, I didn't, I didn't tell him that. I, I, I gave him the, you know, the impression I'm leaving. But let him be free to imagine I'm not actually, you know, officially, you know, gone. You know, if he wants to, you know, bend the rules. And he actually, he actually flew up. Uh, he had some trip here, and I saw him for lunch. But some of my family, you know, they, they reacted, you know, quite disappointed, you know, upset. And I, and I can understand why they say it because you know I used to be a witness. So I can understand their mindset behind this. Um, you know, but so some of them, the relationship seems to be, you know. Uh, on ice for now, but some of them, you know, they, they, some of them don't care as much. They're willing to break the rules a little bit, you know. So compared to some other people, I, I, mean, I've, I got, a, uh, got off a bit lucky there. Mm -hmm. Well, Sean, tell us then, Rick, how you did come to the big kahuna doctrine, as it were, the Trinity, the one that Jehovah's Witnesses despise the most, I think. Yeah, probably, probably it's uh, the, one of the ones they despise the most, yeah. Um, well, it's, so, I, so I was still a strong anti-Trinitarian, 
into late 2015 for sure. Although you could tell there was probably something off a bit, like I, while I was still in high school. In fact, I I was ca- carrying around Augustine's On the Trinity with me, and I was reading that in school, going to witness school with some other witnesses. So you know, looking back, that's kind of a funny image there. You know, a witness so interested in that. But basically, I began to understand it better. Um, I began to see it was distinct from modalism, and now that didn't come black and white. I realized all of that meant because. Looking back, some of my arguments or thoughts against the Trinity still treated it as modalism, which it wasn't, and I increasingly began to realize. But a few things began to clear up in this regard. I began to understand it better. I began to understand, like, when Jesus prays to the Father. Oh, the Trinity doesn't say he's praying to himself. No, it's the Son praying to the Father. Okay, it's, that's a good thing to keep in mind. Um, and it's not saying... Well, actually, before I get into, um, like, Hebrews 1, 3 and the passages that really impressed me, I want to clarify some connections between uh, how witnesses and how I, as a witness in particular, viewed God. And so I mentioned witnesses have a corporeal conception of God. He's kind of made us some ethereal stuff. He has a body of some sort. And so do the angels. And it seems in practice, many witnesses, and I, I, I think I'd number myself in this, kind of think God— is like uh, is uh, only different in degree from angels, not you know in kind. They don't have this radical separation, or it's a bit blurry there. And so they'll say, "Well, God is spirit." Well, well angels. He says he makes his angels spirits. Well, God is holy. Well, God has holy angels. Well, our God is a consuming fire. Well, he makes his ministers flames of fire. They're just, they're kind of the same, you know. And so if somebody were to point out John one one, it says the word was God, and say, "Well." Witnesses, of course, render that a God. But if they point out, well, that means the word has a quality of being God, like Hathael. He, he's, you know, has a divine nature. They'll say, well, you know, angels kind of have that too. And so, you know, you, you run into the brick wall until, as I said, my conception of God began to, you know, improve, get more re- refined. He's incorporeal. He's separated from creatures. And so then, when I came to passages like Hebrews one three, you know, the sun is the radiance of God's glory, the express image or of His very nature. I began to realize, whoa, this is the. Yeah, I think you know, one commentary I've been reading uh, with, with a fellow in my, my church. We've been going over this in Hebrews. It's like he has a very stamp of God's nature, and that seems, you know, well, that's particularly, you know, that's it's interesting. It, it, how, that doesn't seem like something a mere creature would have. And so, and I guess that relates to one thing. As a witness, you know, Jesus is created. He's also called Michael, you know, the archangel, but he's created. That's the, that's the main thing witnesses say. And I'd point to Hebrew or uh, Proverbs 8.22, the Lord made me in the beginning of his ways, or Micah 5.2, whose origin is from eternity, and I'll say he's created. But then I came across, like in some, well, Trinitarian sense, like the early church fathers and onwards would also cite these passages. And I say, but what's going on here? That's kind of strange. And I began to realize, and I noticed in the Nicene Creed, eventually enough, it says he's God from God. He's begotten from the Father before all ages. And at first, I thought this was kind of like an ad hoc, you know, arbit- a distinction without a difference. That just sounds like created. You know, come on, give it a break. But then I began to realize, no, wait, the, well, the, the Trinity doesn't deny the Son is originate in some sense. And there is a significant difference between begotten of the Father before all ages and, you know, creation, like, you know, the created order, you know, even angels and on all these, you know, the, the, the world was created. And I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I, if I understand the difference is this, is the Son is, you know, timelessly begotten from the Father's essence, and so he's coessential with the Father. The world is begotten, it is not begotten, it's created in time, and it's, you know, from nothing. It's not of the Father's nature. And so I said, well, that's, that's a significant difference. And so I can't just point out saying, oh, Jesus has... You know, he's begotten from the Father and saying that's Jesus is created. And so, you know, that really deflates, you know, deflates, uh, you know, your arguments against the Trinity, I, I think. And that's why I think just understanding the Trinity doctrine better went a long way. Um, Boy, there's so, a, a qualitative difference that you're that you're picking up on between saying that Jesus is extremely ancient yeah. <laughs> and saying that he's eternal. Uh, yeah. It's a night and day difference. If he's extremely ancient but still temporal, he's a different kind of being than yeah. the Almighty Creator of the universe. So that that that's a very important distinction that you picked up on. Yeah, of course. Um, it, witnesses, of course, think God was, is within time, and so that's something I began to realize. There's certain problems saying there's an infinite past, and even if there was, saying God's within time. 
So, I mean, I guess, I guess the approximation for a witness would be, you know, he's, you know, he's begot. It's, it's like a, I guess an analogy for a witness, he may, maybe your listeners might be interested in trying out. It's like a man with a mirror. Well, you know, it's sure the, the mirror is going to be, the reflection is going to be co-eternal for them if the mirror existed from eternity past. Um, I, I don't think it, it's, you know, it's an analogy. And of course those break down. And so I'm not sure how useful it is, but the one analogy that really, that really that I found, so I can't remember who said it, but to illustrate that this distinction between begotten, not made is a real important distinction and a true one is like a distinction between if a man and a woman build a birdhouse together, you know, that's some kind of production or origination of some kind, or if they have a, you know, a child together, well, that's, that's a, they're both kinds of origin, but they're really different. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and maybe add a bit word on why I realize this, the father, the son, the, you know, the God's nature is so much different from angelic natures is I, is I realized like witnesses will point out, which is John four twenty four, I believe, you know, God is spirit. Well, angels are spirit. They're the same kind of being, but maybe different degree. Or as I said, witnesses are, I think a bit vague on that point. But I realized, well, that's like saying humans are material. Cats are material. Stones are material or matter. Well, sure, but we're not. We're still different kinds of being, and all it's saying is that we're we have matter as part of our being. Well, if God is spirit, it's saying he's incorporeal and he's immaterial. Well, that's true of angels too, but it doesn't mean they're not significantly different in other ways. In other ways, um, and, and here perhaps is most interesting as far as so I have covered a bit how things are beginning to fall fall in place with regard to the sun. Maybe move over a little bit to the you know, Holy Spirit because witnesses think the Holy Spirit is not a person. It's kind of like part of the Father, his like effective power. He can you know cast in any part of the universe and you know affect things. And you know, like if you were to point out, you know, Jesus calls the Holy Spirit He, and He's our He's another Comforter. Well, that's you know that's personal. A witness will say, you know, that's personification. And you do another case, you know, the Spirit, you know, uh, you know, what's it, well probably like acts. The Spirit can be lied to, personification. And you know, it, it, um. Um, that, that's as, that's as um, fine as far as it goes, you know, because, I mean, if there was only one, here's the, here's the thing I didn't realize. Um, can you still hear me? I thought something went uh, off. Yeah. Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, okay, good. Okay, okay. Um, my screen just went black for a split second. Okay. Um, and so it, it's fine as far as it goes to say, oh, that's personification. Oh, that's personification. But I realized I was missing the forest for the trees. Because each case you can try to say, well, that's personification. And if that was like one of the only few cases, like if only Jesus referred to the Spirit in personal terms, or it was only one or two times in the Bible, sure, maybe that's even probably personification. But as you know, the Spirit is spoken of ubiquitously as personal in the New Testament, not just by Jesus, but we see it in the Acts and Paul's letters, and many times. And so, you know, if, if they're referring to the Holy Spirit as personal, you know, maybe that's just because the Holy Spirit's a person, you know, you gotta, you gotta be pulled back. I remember, I think it was on, is it Glenn Miller, the guy behind Christian Think Tank? Is that Yes, it? yes. Yeah, and so I, I remember I read, read a list he had of all of these things, and that's when I, it dawned on me, like when I took that step back and I said, oh, it's all over the place. And that very ubiquity or universality of the expression really demands that it be taken literally. And that's what really, you know, pushed me. Push me over the push me over the edge with regard to the Holy Spirit, and then you throw in like the triadic passages, like Matthew twenty eight nineteen, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You say, well, the Father's a person, of course. The witnesses will agree. The Son's a person. Yep. And you throw the Holy Spirit in, you're like, well, without any warning that the Holy Spirit isn't a person, well, maybe he's also a person as well. So that's more more evidence, and just pushes me over further. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, this won't be as impressive to many witnesses. They're, you know, in the second century, of course, Christianity went downhill really fast, they'll say. But when I saw like Justin Martyr talking about the Holy Spirit as a person, and Irenaeus in the later second century, you know, I say, well, you know, it's kind of strange that all these early Christians were believing the Holy Spirit's a person. You know, maybe they're on to something, you know. And so that, that really persuaded me there. And so it's another block that began setting in place. Um, and, okay, this is... It's probably the last major block that fell in place was Christ's dual natures. As I mentioned earlier, when I first found out the idea that Jesus is a glorified human, even now, I said, well, that's a weird idea. That sounds like what Mormons say or something like that. You know, I, I, that's what I thought when I first heard it. But then I realized, wait, if Jesus pre-existed, and I, as a witness, believe he did. You know, maybe, and maybe he's not divine or maybe he's just angelic. At the time, I wasn't sure, but he must have two natures because 
this much I know for certain that if like your cat can't become a dog, your dog can't become a tree because it just passes out of existence because he loses his essential nature. Well, if the sun went from being an angelic being, just being a human being, it seems like he just passed, was annihilated and some other being came around. And there's other problems with the witness field in that regard. But so I began to you know, be sympathetic toward this idea that Jesus has two natures. And that began to resolve some contradictory you know, uh, you know, problems with the Trinity I have. Like, well, how come Jesus, you know, I welcome Jesus doesn't know something. And I used to think this, oh, it's because he's human. I used to think, well, that's just some ad hoc move to save the Trinity. And I realized, well, it, it does have some independent motivation here. And then, of course, I came across, you know, I realized Hebrews 1 and 2 is a really great example of Christ's dual nature is, you know, uh, in practice, and I again appreciate that. And then I guess it was just a matter of me looking back and one day realizing, wait, I believe all these things. That's just what it, that's just what it means to believe the Trinity. There's, you know, the Father, Son, and Spirit are distinct persons, but of one infinite divine substance. And, you know, they're coessential. They're all, you know, they're fully, truly God. And so I realized, oh, I believe the Trinity. Well, that was, uh, how did that, that snuck up on me. How did that happen? (laughs) And and I I think even for a while before I really realized it, I kind of did it too. It was more of just like a kind of like psychological doubt because it was still kind of new to me. I'm like, well, is this really true? Like something feels off, something feels off. And then I realized, no, I, I don't have any reason to object to it it's it's true and so I, that was a you know i was uh trying to say of course that's probably one of the most significant errors witnesses have that they deny the, the trinity and well they even go a bit further you know they they don't even have an exalted you know they treat jesus as an exalted creature but they kind of you know put him off to the side even then compared to even what witnesses back in the day used to do but you know so that's that's probably one of the probably most one of the most significant errors uh witnesses have or mm-hmm. that teach Dr. Bowman, any thoughts on what you've just heard? What's that? Any thoughts on what you've just heard? Uh, well, there's so much there. Uh, Sean, I'm, I'm really thrilled to hear your story, and uh, uh, you've made some, some really good points. One that I'd like to go back to that you said a while back that I, I think was very insightful is that uh, Jehovah's Witnesses are taught to think of God as corporeal, yeah. And that this really causes some difficulty in processing the idea of the doctrine of the Trinity. And I, I would put it this way, because I, I, th- I agree with that. It is a real problem. I would put it this way. If God has a body, if Jehovah God has a body, uh, then if you're going to affirm the full deity of Christ, you've either got, and, and of course the person of the Holy Spirit, you've either got to have three persons sharing the one body, which causes a certain you know, uh, obvious difficulties. Like I'm when we think about it. Yeah, witnesses wouldn't be happy with that. No. Or, or you have to think of the Son and the Holy Spirit as two separate deities alongside Jehovah the Father, yeah. and now you've got three gods. And yeah. so once, once you assume uh, or presuppose uh, the corporeality of Almighty God, the doctrine of the Trinity becomes essentially an impossible option mm-hmm. uh, because you can't have, uh, at least in any kind of coherent fashion, uh, three uh, divine beings or persons sharing one body. And if you've got three divine bodies that are separate entities in every you know real sense, then you really have three gods, which, of course, that's what happens in Mormonism. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I think that's very important. It's it's very helpful to understand that the Jehovah's Witnesses' belief in the corporeality of God's nature uh, is one very serious kind of presuppositional impediment to them even taking the doctrine yeah. of Trinity seriously. Yeah, it even reflects to how, like, if you say, well, this, you know, like this. The son is, you know, from the father's essence. Like, well, what does that even mean? Like, he's like, you know, they might think you're talking about the Mormon, like, you know, God literally procreates, like, you know, like basically it's like human does. And then that won't make any sense. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a, that's a you know, and I don't, and I, at a time, I didn't realize, and that's why, that's why, you know, these things fell into place over time. I didn't realize when I first, you know, just realized, oh, God, if he's God, he has to be corporeal. And, you know, there's various reasons for that, you know, but, um, I didn't realize instantly what happened because just, it was just, it was just uh, there was still kind of an inertia, like where I was still thinking, you know, you know, 
even though I was beginning to change my, my mind on some things, there's still an inertia there, and I didn't realize it right away. But I do think, it, yeah, it's one of the most, it is, I think, a serious impediment to their understanding and accepting of the Trinity. Now, Dr. Bowman, I asked you to come on here also because you, I understand you've come up with a new tool you want to use to reach Jehovah's Witnesses. Is that right? Uh, yes. Uh on our website, which is irr.org, uh, I am producing a series of new articles uh, called Answers to Jehovah's Witnesses. And there are eight of these up now, and there are projected to be close to two dozen articles when this series is done. And these articles answer uh, questions uh, that reflect uh, important issues in Jehovah's Witness thinking. So uh, Sean mentioned uh, that I did an article called, Do We Need the Watchtower to Understand the Bible? And that's probably a good example of what these articles do, because uh, in each article I start with uh, explaining what the Watchtower's doctrine is, and I quote a current sources that are used uh, by Jehovah's Witnesses today that you can find uh, on JW.org, which, by the way, I don't know if people know this, but JW.org is the number one religion website in the world. It is the most powerful, most successful, uh, most visited or something like that uh, website in the field of religion, focused on religion in the world. And and by the way, LDS.org is number three. Uh, so the Mormons really need to try a little bit harder, don't they? Yeah. I'm, uh, curious, but, now, I'm curious now who's number two. I, I, I think it might be Bible Gateway or something like that. Okay. So there's, there's a Christian one in there's a Christian one in between. <laughs> so, so what I typically do in these articles is I is I document what the Watchtower's position is from the most recent sources that I can find uh, at on JW.org. Uh, that way, they can't question whether it's uh, not current light or something like that. And in in some cases, the the uh, organization has tweaked its teaching on certain things, and so I'm trying to find out what those weeks are and make sure that I state things as accurately as possible. And then uh, I will usually, or uh, where it's appropriate, uh, the second part of the article will uh, discuss certain internal problems with the Watchtower's position, certain uh, incoherence or inconsistency, uh, you know, where they've really kind of uh, shot themselves in the foot. Uh, with the way that they have presented it. Another example would be, uh, I have an, the first article in the series is, was the Bible corrupted until the New World Translation came along? And I document Watchtower saying things about the Bible not having been corrupted, and also them saying that the Bible has been corrupted, uh, because uh, Jehovah's Witnesses need to say that in order to justify uh, adding the name Jehovah to the New Testament over 200 times and all the other changes that they make. Uh, so the second part of the article typically is dealing with these internal inconsistencies or or uh, problems arising from within the Jehovah's Witness uh, doctrine. And then third, uh, if, if I have that second section, then the, the last section will deal with a biblical response uh, to what the organization's doctrine is, it will explain biblically why uh, they're either misunderstanding the scriptures they're using, or they haven't really uh, uh, understood, uh, you know, uh, certain passages in the Bible that they they're either they're ignoring or they've mistranslated or whatever it might be. Uh, so, uh, as I say, there are eight articles in the series. The most recent one. Uh, that went up is the article entitled, Is Jesus Michael the Archangel? And I'm I'm especially uh, uh, pleased with that particular article. I I think it's very uh, helpful because it doesn't just refute the idea that Jesus is Michael. In the course of doing that, uh, uh, I found new uh, reason to be confident in uh, the deity of Christ, that uh, Scripture, even in the passages that talk about the archangel, uh, clearly distinguishes him from Jesus as the Lord. Uh, the Lord, of course, meaning God, uh, Yahweh. 
And, and you see that in Philippians, I mean, excuse me, in First Thessalonians 4, the famous passage uh, that Jehovah's Witnesses uh, quote out of context to try to prove that, that Jesus is the archangel because supposedly he has an archangel's voice. <laughs> mm-hmm. And, and, I, and my, my comment on that, uh, among other comments, has always been, well, if Paul and his readers already believed that Jesus was an archangel. Why would Paul say that he has an archangel's voice? What other kind of voice would he had? Would he have? Is that like, you know, Abraham Lincoln went to Gettysburg and he spoke with the voice of a man? Well, uh, you know, <laughs> it, we, naturally he was one. You know, so there's something else going on there, and of course, what's going on there uh, is that an archangel is shouting. Uh, here comes the Lord, you know, get ready, <laughs> you know, be prepared because he's coming. Like uh, a, a herald will announce the entrance of a king into a city uh, in, in, in procession uh, in front of him so that when the king came into the city, everybody would be at attention and would be paying, it, you know, rapt attention to the king. Well, that's what the archangel is doing in First Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, and, and the Jehovah's Witness interpretation has misunderstood that. So that's just an example of the kind of information that's presented in these articles uh, to show uh, what the Bible actually says about these things. And hopefully, uh, Christians that read this not only will be better uh, equipped to respond to Jehovah's Witnesses and help Jehovah's Witnesses understand these things, uh, but they'll gain a better appreciation for what Scripture teaches for themselves. Mm-hmm. By the way, I, I have to tell you this. I, I was here at the office on another Saturday a couple weeks ago, and two Jehovah's Witnesses came to the door. And the reason why they came to the door of the office is because our office is in a converted house, and our sign uh, got destroyed by storms a few couple months ago, and we haven't replaced it. So they just thought it was a regular house, and they came up to the door thinking they were knocking on, uh, you know, the, a family home uh, door. And so we got into a conversation, and th- uh, they brought up the the idea that Jesus was Michael the Archangel. I didn't bring it up. They did. So I thought, well, this is interesting. Let's talk about that. So we had an interesting conversation. Uh, they they beat it out of there pretty quickly mm-hmm. when they realized uh, what was going on. But uh, I, I, I think this is an important uh, uh, subject. And so what I'm trying to do in this series is to update uh, our resources on Jehovah's Witnesses. Most of the books and even most of the articles that you find online critiquing the teachings of Jehovah's Witnesses are citing Watchtower literature from 20, 30, or 40 years ago. And while though that literature uh, is worth noting and the doctrines haven't changed radically uh, over that time, I still think it's a good idea to engage the Watchtower's most current d- literature and to make sure that we're as precise as possible in stating what Jehovah's Witnesses believe. So those are some of the goals that I'm setting uh, for this particular series of articles. And this series is all free at the website, right? That's right. People can go to the website and they can access this information for free. Uh, All you have to do is go to IRR.org and you'll see an option to click on Jehovah's Witnesses. And from there, you'll see the section called Answers to Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, which is still a work in progress with these articles. Because I I can't write these quickly. Uh, It takes time to to do the research and to think through uh, some of the issues and to make sure that I'm giving uh, not only the the current uh, Watchtower documentation, but also bringing uh, the best uh, uh, biblical scholarship to bear in dealing with some of these issues. And so, for example, there's two articles uh, dealing with the name Jehovah, and I spent a lot of time uh, working through some of the recent literature on the subject of the divine name so that what I said there would be as accurate as possible. Sean, do you have any thoughts on what you've just heard? Uh, well, one thing that related to uh, what Rob was saying about using uh, more recent Watchtower literature, uh, you know, I think it's always a good idea, especially if uh, news is somewhat 
this is only it's related what at least Rob was saying about using more recent Watchtower literature. And this is especially important if you're trying to persuade them. Like if you, because some people I know they, they like to pull out some old books from the 40s and try to convert. You know, I say told to, to tell the witness this is what you guys said back then. Well, it's only going to you know raise their suspicions. Like what's this guy with all this old literature all the time? <laughs> what is yes. he up to? And that's actually one of the downsides. You want to argue for false prophecies is you're really going to have to go through this old literature. So you got to make sure the witness is you know more open minded. But um, and so that's why I think it's good that you know like you're using some of the more recent literature because they have like since 2000 I think most of their books and watchtowers and so forth are available on like uh, I think it's W O L that jw.org watchtower online right. and so that's why I think it's very good to use more recent literature just for scholarly stuff um, as well. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with you entirely there, although I do think that there should be some way we can use the whole false prophecies argument. I mean, I know it's been a while since the witnesses have made a prophecy, although I wouldn't be surprised if they make one sometime soon. And as they have made one, I haven't heard about it. Any thoughts up there? Well, it's kind of implicit, like, you know, because their current understanding of this generation really has to expire within the next 20 or 30 years. So they're implicitly committed to the end happening or the beginning of the Great Tribulation happening pretty soon. Um, I, I think if you want to argue false prophecies, because like I had a friend, he left in the because of the, the 1975 thing. He left. He was not a witness anymore by the 80s. But I think maybe using the false prediction is probably arguing for false prediction because a witness might be more, you know, prone to say, yeah, it, you know, we made some false predictions, you know, in the past, especially if they were, you know, alive or know about like 1975 or it's, it's easier to establish you guys interpreted the Bible this way. And, you know, it, it, it kind of sidetracks the whole false prophecy thing, and yet it's still pretty powerful. It, it, it avoids the pitfall of, you know, being more offensive, like your leaders are false prophets. You know that? Like, obviously, you wouldn't want to even, you know, phrase it that way. You'd want to be as tactful as you can. But it also avoids having to go through all these old, you know, all these publications and saying, see, they made a claim that said this specific interpretation was revealed to them by God through angels or whatever, because there's some quotes like that. And yet, the, the whole upshot of this argument is, wait, they were wrong all these other times. You're trying, you're trying to get them to think they're inept interpreters of prophecy, and they only kind of are, right? And then, <laughs> yeah. and then the back, and then of course you ask, well, why believe them this time? Oh, well, there's so much evidence. Well, they said there was so much evidence before. And why believe them this time? Why believe them when they say we fulfill these various prophecies showing that the organization is uh, God's, you know, the, the, the truth, and that the governing body is the faithful, discreet slave? But why believe them when they say this? If they were wrong about these prophecies and what they meant, maybe they're wrong about these other ones too. Or, you know, of course, in some cases, they'll say something's a prophecy when it's, you know, pr probably isn't, you know. But the point is, Oh, okay, well, I can't believe – the upside of this is really to try to get them to think, I can't believe they're the truth because of the prophecies that they, the, the prophecies they fulfill. And so you have to, you know, you kind of you know, shift them over to, let, well, let's see what they teach. And then, of course, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of like where I was, you know, several years ago. I, I was more concerned with what they said and why they said it than with who said it. And, you know, that quickly enough devolved into, oh, well, they're wrong on these, you know, very important things. Um, I'd like to, to make a suggestion, and that is that uh, uh, one thing that, you know, the typical uh, Christian who wants to share this kind of information with a Jehovah's Witness that comes to the door can do, or on the street corner or wherever, or maybe even someone they know from work or school, is to say, you know, I, uh, I, I went to a website that talked about the history of Jehovah's Witnesses' uh, understanding of Bible prophecy and the predictions that they made. And I found some information there that I found uh, rather troubling. And I'm wondering if you could look at it and maybe tell me where this information is is incorrect or, or how you as a Jehovah's Witness would explain it. And then you're 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 being humble. You're you're not uh, being aggressive with it, but you're saying, you know, this information's out there. It's online. Anybody can look at it. I've seen it. Uh, if this isn't true, I'd like to know what's wrong with what it says about the Jehovah's Witnesses' false predictions. Uh, but if it is true, I, I think it's worth knowing about and, and having some kind of understanding of. And that might be a way of, of, uh, of 
you know, sort of finessing the problem of citing old literature. Well, you're citing a current website that anybody can yeah. look at, and, and it just happens to include documentation from the entire history of Watchtower publications. Uh, and the other thing I would say is this. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses are still teaching the 1914 date. Mm-hmm. They're still preaching 1914. And the problem is that everything they say about 1914 now is contrary to what they used to say about 1914 before 1914. Into the 20s or 30s. Yeah, and so uh, just to, to uh, ask Jehovah's Witnesses that bring up 1914, you can you could just sort of ask them some questions, like, uh, did your religion know ahead of time that these things were going to be fulfilled in 1914? Oh yes, you know they'll probably tell you, oh yes. I would say, well, you know, now maybe I'm wrong about this, but my understanding is that they did not have a correct understanding of 1914. In fact, they predicted 1914 as the end of this system of things, the end of the age, uh, the end of the time of trouble, you know, the end of the last generation before Armageddon, etc. Not the beginning of the end, but the end of the end. And, uh, you know, and then point them to that, to that material. I'd say one other thing, and that is that when Jehovah's Witnesses admit, oh yes, we did make mistakes, we made a mistake about 1925, or we made a mistake about 1975, one way of, of, of uh, following up on that, and Sean, you, you suggested this, and I think this is, is a fine way to do it, is to say, well, if you don't believe them about those things, why are you believing them about these other things? But I think there's another way of sort of nuancing that, and that is to say, well, what have you as a religion learned from those mistakes? Because those mistakes were made on the basis of use, utilizing a particular method of interpreting the Bible, of trying to correlate the Bible with contemporary history and contemporary events, and trying to, to kind of create a chronological uh, timeline of the end times based on what you thought was the sure teaching of Bible prophecy. So, those dates, 1925 and 1975 and all that, those were arrived at using the same methods that your religion used to, uh, to come up with the 1914 date, yes, which you're cool. still holding on to. So the question isn't, did you make a mistake? The question is, did you learn anything from the mistake? Because if you had, you wouldn't be holding on to the 1914 date because it rests on just as shaky a foundation as these dates that you've abandoned. Uh, yeah. Sean, before you answer, I'd like to remind everyone that you're listening to the Deeper Waters podcast. I'm Nick Peters, your host. Got doc- we got Dr. Rob Bowman on the show today, along with Sean Kalecki, an ex Jehovah's Witness. But if you're here next week... We're going to be talking about the flood, and to help us talk about it, we have a Tremper Logman coming on to join us, who's written a, co-authored a book recently with John Walton, who couldn't join us this time. Tremper Logman is going to be talking about the lost world of the flood. What should, how should we probably understand the flood narrative in Genesis? But for now, let's get back to the Dr. Bowman and Sean Clacky. Now, Sean, you were getting ready to respond to what you heard there? Yeah. Well, I, th- I think that's a good it's a good point because the method really for the most part hasn't changed. I mean, for ex- you can use a particular example like with 1975, they got that from the same procedure they got 1874, which is when they used to think Christ's presence began. Because yes. they just they just said, oh, our translation was off, and we also we also forgot to include there's no zero AD. And okay, well 1975, <laughs> oh, didn't work. Okay. And actually, one thing, if anyone's really interested for a quick overview, I think Wikipedia and their article on eschatology of Jehovah's Witnesses have a nice chart toward the bottom. You can see, like, when they used to say the last days began in 1799. It's really useful and has uh, some citations as well, um, though, you know, there's also other lists as well. Um, And also, if anyone's out there who wants to try to make the, you know, like they have a friend who's more, you know, who are willing to hear you out on these false prophecy thing, one thing to keep in mind is that Witnesses do have numerous statements in their literature over the decades saying we're not false prophets we don't claim inspiration 
our infallibility or we were not, we're not inspired you know by visions or anything like that and what's well, that's as fine as far as it goes but you know this is kind of a there is, there is an inconsistency here in what witnesses say about their role their leader's role interpreting prophecy and what those predictions are you know it's this in some way it's like the right hand doesn't know what the left hand's doing well you know i, I think they do but you know it seems like for instance okay i'm gonna pull it by the, if you, they'll, they'll say things like we didn't just, just our humble interpretation, our conjecture, and what we think the Bible says. You know, we're trying to be sincere about this, and we were just wrong. But so, if a witness, you know, if you're going to make this argument, you have to be aware of these kinds of statements too, because you know, from witness, those are going to be much more appealing, saying, "See, look, we're innocent of this. Our leaders didn't do anything wrong." But you have to keep in mind, say, "Well, you know, th that's fine, but is that the only thing they were saying?" And then. It, I guess it's helpful to keep in mind that witnesses claim that you know together their governing body that they call the faithful and discreet slave is guided by God, and that's kind of a vague term. It's like uh, it allows them some leeway. I think they'll, they'll say, well, you know, we, we're there, our leaders are guided by God, but you know maybe they weren't paying close enough attention to His guidance, and you know they're claiming guidance in some general kind of way, and that you know that permits them to make some errors here and there, and you know maybe, maybe if that's all they were claiming, you know maybe it's not as big a deal. It'd still be pretty bad all the same, but it, it's if you want to make this case, you had to point out that they say things specifically, like this interpretation, this set of interpretations, these predictions and interpretations of past events are revealed by God. They'll even sometimes say, Rutherford used to say that they were given to the anointed by angels, somehow. It wasn't clear, but said, so they were making all these specific claims. And, and in light of even what they say about what a false prophet is and their their both their handbook reasoning from the scriptures, and of course you can go to you know Deuteronomy and elsewhere in the Bible describes a false prophet. It sure sounds like they're being a prophet. They're attributing their claims and predictions to a superhuman source, God in this case, of course. And well, they evidently weren't from God because they didn't come true. And so that's that's a that's a problem because you know they they even, uh, they fall on their own sword when it comes to their definition of false prophet, and then of course they try to in that book I mentioned reasoning from the scriptures they try to uh, save themselves, but really it's mostly a bunch of red herrings like well, we never really lost our faith in you know God and you know we teach you know good stuff too well you know but does that mean those weren't prophecies like that seems a little you know red herring right there um so I, just, just be mindful that you know there, there there is some kind of case witnesses kind can try to muster up for themselves it's not a good one ultimately but you, you, you shouldn't ignore it if you're trying to talk to a witness because they'll just think you're you know you're just you know you're just biased against them you know hey, sean i think uh, another way that uh, the same uh, kind of point can be made is to ask the jehovah's witness when they say well we're just you know doing our best to try to understand Scripture and the Watchtower uh, leadership that came up with these interpretations were fallible people who who uh, have admitted that they made mistakes and it's just not a big deal and we're not claiming to be any kind of a, you know, uh, big authority or anything, just, just doing our best to understand these things. So you say, all right, so let's say you're living in the 1960s or early 1970s and you're a Jehovah's Witness and you are absolutely convinced from your study of the Bible that the Watchtower Society is teaching error on the subject of 1975. Are you allowed to speak publicly as a Jehovah's Witness and to say that you disagree with this teaching and that you realize the Watchtower leaders are doing their best, but you think that in this case, they're just wrong? Would you be allowed to do that? Now, if they're honest, they're going to have to say, no, you're not allowed to do that. No. And likewise today, if the Watchtower is teaching something today that you believe is wrong, are you allowed as a faithful member of the religion to say, you know what, I think on this particular point, my leaders are just wrong. And I think, again, if they were honest, they'd have to say, no, you may hold that opinion privately, but you're not allowed to uh, voice it publicly. You're not allowed to express that openly because to do so is to run against, is to run ahead of Jehovah's organization uh, or whatever expression that they want to use yes, to try to explain that. And, uh, and, and, and we just have to follow along she like sheep and, and do whatever the society tells us to do and believe whatever, you know, publicly teach whatever they tell us to teach. And in that case, whether they claim infallibility or not, yeah. they're acting 
as if they're infallible. Yeah, they, yeah, they want they want they they want their cake and eat it too. They want the authority of a prophet, but you know the leeway, like well, if things go wrong. Well, we don't. We never really really saying we're a prophet, but they, yeah, they want their deniability. cake. deniability. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it's like uh, yeah. It, it, you know, some, uh, something I keep thinking of this is asking a question that my former roommate once asked of the, some Mormons when they were getting some things wrong, like the bad archaeology of the Book of Mormon. So I said, look, if I you take what Jesus says, and he said, look, if I can't trust you on the things that I can test, the prophecies and such, why should I trust you on the things I can't test? Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and in that regard, um, here, here's, a, here's a slight thing, maybe it's, it's, it's related to this whole thing, too, because Rob was mentioning earlier, like, well, did your leaders and your, your people, your organization say, did they know all this stuff was going to happen before 1914? And I'll say, oh, of course they do. And actually, sometimes in various watchtowers, sometimes they will say, oh, they were saying 1914 was the beginning of the last days. But of course, Russell is saying, no, it's like the end. Like, 1914 comes, all the governments and religions and most societal institutions, if not all, would all fall apart. The Jews would come back to Israel and come to faith, and it's the end of the world. That's it. So, they, of course, they were wrong on that. But sometimes they will actually say as if, oh, we knew this all along. We knew this was all going to happen. And other times they're a bit more honest, and they'll say, you know, we made a mistake here. But, you know, that's something... You, you just mentioned, like, well, can, how can I trust you? If you say this, I can just check your old, you know, you know, literature at the time. I see you're lying about what you guys were saying, or you're confused on what you're saying. This doesn't, you know, help. Uh, this doesn't, doesn't inspire tr- uh, credibility on my part. And so that's uh, something to keep in mind as well, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm curious also. Does anyone think it could be worthwhile when talking with witnesses and talking about prophecy to mention the Great Pyramid of Gaza? Um. I, it might sound a bit, because obviously, you know, I, I guess, um, I mean, I'll, I'll have Rob, you, you, you want to say something about that first? No, uh, no uh, you, you go ahead. I, I think it's something that a person would have to decide on a case-by-case basis, whether it was worth bringing up. But, I, you know, no, you go ahead. I, I guess I bet I'd sound kind of the same there, because, I mean, it, it, because, you know, because it, it, for those who don't know, I guess, because, you know, Russell was and it wasn't just limited to Russell, even you know some other people. It was a kind of a, a, a fad back then. The pyramidology you can measure various parts of the pyramid. You know, just measure various whatever parts suited your predictions or interpretations. And that was a really you know strong support in Russell's mind about his eschatology, which of course was abandoned after you know it didn't come about. Um, and objectively speaking, it would be you know problematic for a witness today to think, wait. Russell is getting this from the pyramids? Like, what? what, kind of, what <laughs> yeah. Not the Bible. I mean, he thought it was the Bible's helper in stone, or I think somebody he called it something like that. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess mm-hmm. if they're not going to be impressed by the very the fact that, you know, everything Russell said was false, it's, I guess it's case by case. Because some witnesses already know about it, and they just don't they don't think it's important. Because, you know, there's a lot they can shuffle under, well, you know, nobody's, nobody's perfect. You know, I guess, I guess they can – case by case is probably the best way to do it, you know. Uh, John, I think it's also true that Jehovah's Witnesses are taught and have been taught for a long time uh, that the organization prior to, I think, the date that's usually thrown around is 1919, uh, was still partially corrupted or polluted with pagan Babylonish thinking. And it had to to have a a full, you know, sort of... uh, uh, house cleaning uh, at that point in order to restore pure, true worship of Jehovah God uh, beginning at that time. And and the reason why they say that, I think, is twofold. One, there's some things about Russell that they don't want to have to defend. And two, uh, they want to argue that uh, they are the one true uh, religion of Jehovah God that survived the splintering of the Bible student movement after the death of Russell. Yeah, yeah, and uh, of course it's, it's still funny because uh, you know they they still you know celebrated Christmas until 1926. So I guess that wasn't as important to Clancy. You know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that, that's one. That's why it's, I, I, that's a good point to bring up, and it escaped my mind. Uh, you know, cause they, it, it helps. It's kind of a, it helps there. Oh, nobody's perfect, but you know they were they had the right heart and they were willing to you know drop some of Russell's odder ideas. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah, I don't know about the effectivity and the uh, the effectiveness of our, you know arguing about the Gaza pyramid. I guess if somebody you know 
it should, it should be troubling. It's kind of weird. He's just arguing off a pyramid, you know, like, oh, yeah. that's, that's where I get my eschatology from and that and my frosted flakes cereal box over there. <laughs> but, um, uh, actually I, I eat Cheerios, but I know, uh, yeah, you know, so I, I have nothing more to say about the, uh, the Gaza, uh, the pyramid. I do yeah. think that the pyramidology stuff, uh, is interesting in that it's an example of one of the things that Russell and his associates picked up from other Christians in the 19th century, because I I do want to make this clear. Uh, This was an idea that was being circulated uh, among Christians in the 19th century. It wasn't some pagan idea. There were Christians that were trying to argue that the pyramids were uh, secretly encoded with, uh, you know, information left there by the Israelites. Uh, back. This is, of course, uh, there was a popular idea that the Israelites were involved in building the pyramids. Uh, and that turns out to be uh, erroneous. But in any case, uh, there was... Uh, there were there were a number of issues uh, in the 19th century uh, American Christianity that Russell is simply part of, and in fact, and here's where I think bringing up some past history really could be illuminating for a Jehovah's Witness, is to say let me let me ask you about a, another religion, not Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, uh, I want to talk about a Baptist named William Miller. Mm-hmm. Most of them have never heard of William Miller. And I see this Baptist, and, and of course, saying that he's a Baptist immediately, he's a bad guy. <laughs> mm-hmm. So uh, this Baptist named William Miller predicted that Jesus was going to come back in 1843. When Jesus didn't show up in 1843, he did a recalculation and said that it was going to happen in October of 1844. When that didn't happen, he gave up the whole thing, but some of his followers didn't, and they ended up starting a new religion based on their reinterpretations of William Miller's failed predictions that he claimed were the teachings of the Bible. Now, do you think this sounds like a solid foundation for a new religious movement to be based on failed predictions Uh, of a discredited Bible teacher? And I think the answer would be obvious to any Jehovah's Witness. Of course not. But uh, then I would say you're in exactly the same boat. Uh, Russell was an Adventist. He was part of uh, an Adventist splinter group, not the Seventh-day Adventists, but he was part of a, a splinter group of Adventists who were using the same interpretive system that William Miller used, but just recalibrating the chronology so that instead of the end of the age happening in 1844, it was supposed to happen in 1874 or 1914, depending on what you meant by the end. There would sort of be an end before the end, but you notice they all end in four. Well, that's because all they were doing was just jiggling the dates a bit. The, The whole scheme was already there before Russell came along. The the seven times of Daniel, meaning 2,520 years, that had been around for a long time. Uh, interpreting Daniel as predicting uh, the end of the age sometime in the 19th or 20th century, that had been around for quite a while before Russell. All he's doing is he's recasting the same silliness in his own way, writing his own books and presenting the material in his own way, and he's just as wrong as they were. The only difference now is that your religion is founded on his teachings that you have reinterpreted, your leaders have reinterpreted the same way Ellen G. White and James White and the other Seventh-day Adventists reinterpreted the failed predictions of William Miller. There's no difference. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, that's that's really good. You know, before we go on to another point, I'll go ahead since is that be a proper time of show and that we know that uh, you're listening to a Deeper Waters podcast and everything you do we you hear is supported by listeners like you. And guys, I gotta tell you how important this is. I mean, this is the first new show we've had in a while because first off, on the nineteenth, I was in Greensboro for a mention of ours conference and we had a a guest schedule for 26, but he had a cancer. It was just as well because on Thursday that week, the 24th, 
Ali and I were in a pretty major car accident, and our car was totaled. We were taken to a hospital in an ambulance, and you'll be pleased to know there was apparently no permanent injuries or anything of that sort. But I can tell you that I was in intense pain for the past few days. I mean, it was only a couple of days ago that things started to die down finally and such. But pretty much any time I would bend my head, it'd be like someone had stuck a knife in my head or something. Getting in a good position to lie down in bed at night and such was incredibly painful for me. And... Allie has had some big bruises on her from the seatbelt, the airbag, and everything else. And right now, she's also dealing with some depression. I understand it happens after an accident that adrenaline dies down, you get depressed. And she's dealing with that, too. So we're, we've both been having a hard time here. And the only reason we have another car is because Mike and Debbie gave us their old one. And they went and got themselves a new one. But, people, this is why your support is so needed, because if they hadn't done that, we couldn't be able to get around and do all the things that we need to do and such, including my going to the library and get books that I use for research purposes and things like that. So, I really want to encourage you to consider donating to us, and I'm also hoping to get some speakers here so we can do Facebook Live easier and things like that. But go to deeperwatersapologetics.com and you see a link on my side, help support the work of Deeper Waters Christian Ministries. You go, click the link in there and it takes you to the ministry of a uh, Risen Jesus, Mike and Debbie Lacona, those are my end bars. And you make a donation and then you uh, tell them, hey, I want you tell Mike or Debbie or Al or myself, hey, I made a donation. I want to go to Nick Peters. I want to go to Deeper Waters. We will make sure that we get that donation. It will be tax deductible for you. You can also buy some books on Amazon by written or co-written. Written include a, or limited to a creed for the ages, the Apostles Creed and today's Christian. Co-written are books like Defying Inerrancy, Groundless, God and Natural Disasters. And also, just recently, we've had the Mention of Bars Project book put up for sale. And that's me and four other apologists answering questions. Forty different questions. So I'd encourage you to go that route also. And then we have another route. Now guys, I'm not sure if you've noticed this fact. If, if you haven't noticed this fact, you're probably not married at all. But women tend to like jewelry. It For some reason, they, they go crazy over it. And if you want to get something special at late in your life, we have a lady who sells jewelry, and she's said that if anyone buys through us, from her, 25% of what they purchase will go to deeper waters. And that's the way you can buy something special at late in your life and support a ministry at the same time. Get in touch with me if you want more information on that. And you know, guys, what I've always told you about this, you can buy something special about lady in your life, to make up that big screw up that you just did with her. Or you can buy some of that lady in your life to make up that big screw up that I know you're going to make with her. And <laughs> yes, yes, you know how it is, don't you? <laughs> and um, if uh, if you can't do any of this, please go on iTunes and leave a positive review of the Deeper Waters podcast. I love to see them. Now, Dr. Bowman, do you have an organization you'd like to see people donate to? Well, yes, thank you for uh, mentioning that. I I would be especially excited simply if people would visit the website and, and read some of our resources and, and take advantage of that opportunity. All of our uh, articles, and we have hundreds of articles on our website, all of them are free. And uh, the website is irr.org. That stands for Institute for Religious Research, and that's irr.org. We have articles on Jehovah's Witnesses in what's called wit.irr.org, 
And uh, we also have uh, a section on Mormonism, a section on biblical Christianity. And I would especially encourage people to visit the biblical Christianity section because that's where we present positive uh, articles uh, defending the Bible, defending the historicity of Jesus Christ, uh, defending the existence of God and answering theological questions about such subjects as the Trinity, which we've been talking about a little bit today. And uh, that's a, a special interest of mine going back, as I mentioned earlier, uh, pretty close to 40 years ago. So uh, there, there's, a, there's a lot there, and I hope people will take advantage of that. Visit our website, and uh, we sure appreciate uh, anybody that does that. Also, uh, if you want to follow my blog, it's pretty easy to find. It's Robert Bowman. Dot net. That's Robert Bowman, B-O-W-M-A-N dot N-E-T. Oh, Sean, do you have an organization you'd like to see people donate to? Um, none, none in particular. I guess uh, if anyone's listening, uh, you know, hey, find a good local charity uh, volunteer there. Maybe your church has something uh, going on. And, mm-hmm. you know, how about it? So, you know, Amen. To get back to our conversation, sometimes we're not far about the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Watchtower. I like to compare them to the Matrix and how people in the organization are so plugged in, they don't even realize that they're hopelessly dependent on the system, as it were, and the goal is really to try to get them unplugged so they can see what reality is like. Uh, What do you all think of that kind of analogy? Oh, well, uh, I guess I'll go first a little bit. Well, I'm... It's been a while since seen the Matrix movie, so I guess I'll go memory. But I think, as I mentioned earlier, I think a lot of uh, you know witnesses they accept it because oh, the governing body says it, and as I mentioned earlier, they tie it in and well, Jehovah says it. You know, I can't go against Jehovah. How that'd be wrong? And so, and so I guess as long as they think that way, they'll be you know, will be closed minded. They won't want to hear you know. They won't. They won't really take seriously any questions or you know arguments or anything uh, contrary to that. And so I guess it's somebody, somebody to separate, you know, Jehovah from, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses, the, the organization, as they call it. Um, and also, uh, you know, we realize they're not as dependent as, they don't need to be dependent as they, as they think they are. I do think that, uh, we mentioned this earlier, it's getting harder and harder for Jehovah's Witnesses to remain insulated from information from outside the Watchtower Society. It used to be Jehovah's Witnesses were kept busy all week reading Watchtower articles and Watchtower books and going to studies and regurgitating what they were reading in the in the little article, study articles. And uh, <laughs> I think in many cases they didn't even have time to read the Bible because they were so reading, so busy reading the Bible helps, uh, as they were called. But now... Uh, of course, a lot of this material they find online when they go to JW.org, but it's pretty difficult to make Jehovah's Witnesses not go to other websites. And you'll often find, I think, uh, even is something as innocent as a Jehovah's Witness interested in a particular topic that he's been studying will try to do some further research on his own, uh, perhaps by Googling it or whatever, and then he'll run across material that uh, does not comport with what he was taught was the case. And so it's getting harder uh, to maintain this kind of insulation of uh, the membership from outside information. And so uh, I think that uh, we're seeing uh, quite a bit of hemorrhaging of the membership, particularly in the United States, but uh, perhaps other places as well. But I do think they're having a very difficult time. it used to be Jehovah's Witnesses were growing like gangbusters in the United States. That has that has uh, stopped. Uh, I don't even think they're keeping up with general population growth in most parts of the world where they're uh, where they're uh, existing. So uh, the 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 fear and the danger here is uh, that as they are abandoning uh, their uh, Watchtower dogma that they're going into just rank unbelief and skepticism. And so very, very often that is the case. So we want to do everything we can, not just to explain what's wrong with Jehovah's Witness doctrine uh, or why the Watchtower is a false organization. Uh, We... We, we should do that. We should present that information. We should do what we can to help 
make that available and make that clear. But at the same time, we need to uh, provide Jehovah's Witnesses with uh, an alternative, a positive alternative from Scripture of what biblical Christianity really looks like and, and how biblical Christians really live. And, you know, that it's not uh, a bunch of man-made rules and do this and don't do that and don't touch that and so forth, which Paul, of course, criticized that kind of uh, pseudo-pious religion in Colossians chapter 2. Uh, we want to discourage uh uh, that and we want to encourage uh, Jehovah's Witnesses to find a, a, a healthy Christian faith that's not based on the uh, shifting sands of the uh, interpretations of the Watchtower Society. So I, I think that we we have an opportunity is what I'm trying to get at. It's very difficult for Jehovah's Witnesses to remain insulated. The younger ones in particular are not uh, as easily uh, kept. Uh, you know, under wraps <laughs> as it used to be. And so we, sh we need to take advantage of that opportunity by, uh, you know, letting these people know, uh, these especially young Jehovah's Witnesses know that there are answers, uh, that uh, there's, there's a sound version of biblical Christianity that's not dependent on, on the, the machinations and the, the authoritarianism and of the Watchtower Society. And, and, uh, and be a, be friends uh, where we know them in person. Be friends that can be a safe place to turn when Jehovah's Witnesses have doubts. Uh, that someone that they know takes the Bible seriously, as Sean was mentioning earlier, how impressed he was simply by the fact that he was encountering evangelical Christians who took the Bible seriously. We need to do everything we can in our own churches and in our own Christian homes uh, not to be the stereotypical a uh, householder that the Jehovah's Witness runs into that doesn't know the Bible, that isn't serious about the Christian life, we need to show them a positive alternative. Yeah, you know, something that you both have mentioned, I think it's worth talking about. Uh, Dr. Bowman, let me ask you, uh, have you been to a Jehovah's Witness uh, kind of service before? I'm not sure what you call it, but we are gathering to get meetings. Yes, yeah, not for a long time, but mm -hmm. I, I have I have been to a couple of meetings, and I've also been to uh, the memorial service uh, once. That was many years ago. The memorial service is the once a year uh, a meeting where Jehovah's Witnesses do their version of communion. Uh, and I, I was there just in attendance just to watch, not to do anything or cause any trouble. And so that was very interesting to observe that. But the the, the meetings that they have, and they're, they're really not worship services, they're really meetings. Uh, they are, uh, at least in my recollection from the ones I went to and from listening to uh, uh, former Jehovah's Witnesses even more recently talk about their experiences, they're very dry. Uh, they're very... Uh, kind of business-like, and uh, uh, you know, there, there's there's not much there to get excited about. But they are they are thoroughly indoctrinated at those meetings, and that's that's been the goal. But again, I, I I'd, and I'd like to hear from Sean about this. I do think the dynamics of the religion uh, are, are changing and are being forced to change. I mean, even they, they've I think they've had to downsize. Uh, even at the top, because uh, they uh, their headquarters became too uh, pricey for them to hang on to, and they they were under threats of lawsuits and things yeah. like that. They, they uh, don't want to will last fifty years, you know, past the end of the world. That's how long it will last. Yeah, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Do you have anything else to say? No, no, no. You go ahead. Okay. Well, I know some things they've, uh, like back then, I remember when we did the, the Sunday talk was uh, 45 minutes, now it's only 30 minutes, and the, the public watch there, they even, they only have that, uh, they only have, I think, three different ones a year, and now it's only 16 pages instead of 32. They're downsizing a lot of things. Uh, the What Does the Bible Really Teach book is being replaced with its simplified cousin, what can we learn from the Bible, and, and the meetings are much more video, they have more videos and stuff like that, and I never liked that. Um, I, I guess I'm a, I'm a boring kind of person, so I was perfectly happy with the boring stuff but uh, <laughs> you know I, 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 I'm sort of opinion we should all be using stone tablets and you know what no, no, I'm just kidding but uh, <laughs> uh, 
Well, I think I think there's some things that are changing. And one thing I, I wanted to take of one the one thing that came to mind when you're talking about you know having they can no longer hide you know stuff like on the internet. I remember when they would quote like you know like evangelical scholars or you know Catholic scholars or you know Jewish scholars or whatever. They wouldn't. They would do kind of obliquely. They wouldn't have any real citation. Like I, I just looked up. Uh, one time they did uh, cite uh, Craig Blomberg once in a 96 Watchtower, but they don't have uh, any citation. And they'll mention, like, D.A. Carson, like, one, like, two. They did once in a while they'll cite a name, but when they cite things, they don't really uh, give you any, like, the you know, citation, so you can't go on out to the library and do your own uh, research as easily. Um, but uh, that's one thing that was interesting. But I, mean, I guess uh, a lot of it's changing. I mean, uh, I guess maybe nominalization has kind of been, been setting in over time. Like even to be a regular pioneer, it used to be like a hundred hours, and now it's like seventy or fifty hours a month of going door to door, and they have a new auxiliary. It's thirty hours, so it's like a. And so I mean, in some way that kind of helps because now uh, they're more free to, uh, you know, I guess they they maybe not feel as you know so so tight within the organization because it's maybe there's a growing number of nominal witnesses. Although um, I guess that's maybe that'd be behind some of the. the Changes. They went down from three meetings to two every week. They they call them five meetings, even though like they're just three different parts will be in one you know, meeting. So I never understood that ordering. But yes, I think I think there's um there's a change is because uh, it's taking more time and people aren't I guess is willing to put as much time into it. But that might give them more time to do you know go online and you know, see what's on there. Yeah, Sean, do you think that uh, there's uh, some likelihood at, that in the maybe not too distant future, they're going to phase out uh, putting such a strong emphasis on uh, uh, door-to-door proselytizing. It seems to me that... They kind of are. I yeah, mean, I, I think they already are to some extent because my, you know, basically they're, if I could use this expression, which I think is a perfectly appropriate expression, their business model was more or less based on something like the Fuller Brush Man. They they would go door to door, and they're basically trying to sell their religion uh, to people at the door in the same way that the Fuller Brush Company would send out salesmen going door to door. Well, that was an accepted thing in the 20s and 30s, uh, but it's gone the way of the dodo, and you, you don't have salesmen going door to door anymore. And I, I think that the Jehovah's Witnesses have been... Uh, struggling for decades now with diminishing returns on the investment of all these billions of hours that they report every year doing in in their proselytizing work in the annual yearbook statistics. You're thinking, what, you put in two billion more hours this year and you got how many converts? You know? Uh, yeah, so, well, definitely, because there's less people home during the day, because, you know, sometimes either right. you know, both husband and wife are working or, you know, the woman's not married, she's also not at home, and so what they do is like, more and more they did in, like, public car witnessing or have tables at malls or sometimes at colleges and other places like that where they you know they stand around waiting for someone to come to them. But door to door is still their most what most witnesses do. But it's they're increasingly exploring other options just because you know there's less people like who, who who talks about religion when people come to your door anymore? Who for the whoever did you know? But you know I mean I, I you still get some people doing it, but I see it's it's not as because if you're a witness and you're going door to door for a whole year and no one ever becomes your return visit, as they call them, if you, you know, or you study, you know, like it just seems vain and so you don't want to do it anymore. And I guess they're feeling that. Um, I guess also maybe it relates to the general decline in like, uh, maybe the maybe the increase, of, you know, the, I'm a spiritual, not religious, and so they don't really take as many religious matters seriously. And so the Jehovah's Witnesses are just one of many, and so I don't, you know, ignore them. You know, it's not as important. And it's very, I'm not sure of all the socio, you know, socio um, demographic reasons behind this. But I think Witnesses are, are changing into, you see, like they have, you know, like JW Broadcasting, which is, you know, Witnesses back in the 80s or 70s would have been horrified by that because that just seems too like televangelists to them. And, you know, and they're much more online. You know, back in the day, Watchtower.org and stuff was just some, you know, weird old looking website because they were all old looking websites back then. But they, and only recently have they been really focused on like, uh, you know, uh, like a phone app. They've been much more focused on technology and on online stuff. Uh, that's one thing that's been changing about them. Because uh, even at meetings, most witnesses now don't use physical Bibles or watchtowers. They use it on their uh, phones or tablets. That's one thing that uh, uh, changes happened. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what it says about the general 
Yeah, the Jehovah's uh, Witnesses that came to my the Jehovah's Witnesses that came to my ministry's door a couple of weeks ago, uh, they were looking at their phones for the Bible texts. Yeah, yeah, maybe they were. Trying, they also try to show people videos too. Um, I never got on board in that. I said no. I'm gonna. In fact, even when I went door to door, had a study. I mostly I would just prefer just to use the Bible. But then eventually I had to take other people along, and I'm like, okay, I better use the uh, the, the uh, some booklets they've given me. But. Um, uh, so that's one. That's, that's one thing that's been changed about witnesses. I don't know. I don't know how it necessarily how. I guess it, because a more online presence, of course, means you know you're more likely to come in contact with you know you know negative you know material criticizing witnesses. That's I guess that's a good thing. You know, I have to say that I did go once to a meeting with my roommate before I married Ali, and while I was there, and we were watching it, we both got to our car at the end. I said, and we both agreed. This is one of the most frightening things we have ever been to. I mean, everything about it was just creepy. I mean, even the music they had playing, the music was coming from some sort of tape recording and such. And hearing all these people say things like, We are so thankful for a faithful and discreet slave, providing us food at a proper time. And we used to wonder about why the witnesses who came to see us were so impressed about the answers that we gave. I mean, it's just, hey, we're just answering questions and such. Where we got it, we found out why. Because when they answer the questions, they answer the questions verbatim from the book. So yeah, that you know, it was it was just a scary thing. And then of course at the end, there was the whole love bombing where they surround you and love on you and such. And it doesn't work on me a bit, but I, that, that was just my impression of what was going on. Well, I don't know, the last year I went, I just got bored most of the time because uh, you know I was increasingly not believing this stuff, and so. I would just read other things the whole time, you know, during the during during there, and I still give like a comment or two. I, I never, I never like the verbatim ones. I, and most people paraphrase a little, but I would just like one time I was reading, uh, in Craig Blomberg's uh, book about the historical historical reliability of the Gospels. He was talking about typological prophecies and how a certain passage was fulfilled. And I had a, this was like two years ago or so, something like that, and I had a talk on something that passage, and so I just used the material out of there, and I I, 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 I didn't like so much relying on the watch. That that, that part always irritated me like you know i i think i when i was a re, you know, real strong witness i'm like i already know this stuff i don't need to recite you know verbatim what's going on there i'll just you know i i already know this stuff and then when i was disagreeing i didn't even i think i one time i actually said i snuck in to see if anyone noticed i said something like uh and you know the, the, the eternal son or something like that or are they you know he's from the father's essence i i, I wanted to say, i don't think anyone noticed i said that but <laughs> <laughs> i don't think they did either because you're still with us today yeah, or, uh, I I do jokes to amuse myself sometimes too. I throw in like uh, these weird analogies, like you know, and purple man shirts. I, that's my job. I, it's you know, you're not gonna get this because they do they right now. They're not even so much a talks. So they do like uh, demonstrations for how like how to you know minister you know go out and you know door to door ministry they call it. And so that's a lot of what their service meeting or their you know the mid week meeting is. And so I just come out with all these outlandish characters, you know, the pass the time because I was getting pretty. Uh, Boards. I, never, I never actually studied most of the Watchtower. I just looked through them once. I'm like, I've been taught this for years. I think I know how it's going. But um, uh, I don't know. But uh, here, one thing I wanted to maybe ask uh, about you, Rob, about uh, it, it relates to the doctrine that I thought was most, I mentioned earlier, you know, kind of existentially important, which you know relates to how, how Christ was raised up, how we will also be raised up, how everyone who's in Christ is born again, which you know witnesses deny. Um, because they denied, you know, the physical resurrection of Christ Jesus. He wasn't raised human. And they. And I wanted to, do, Rob, at the top of your head, Rob, do you know uh, what Romans 8.23 says? Or, or what, oh, yes, or, where, where Paul says that we're awaiting the redemption of our bodies. Yeah. yeah. And, and the, witness, the witness translation says, you know, that we're awaiting the release from our bodies. Oh, yes. Bodies. Yeah, that's a terrible travesty of a mistranslation isn't it oh my goodness yeah i, I was asking my my friend i have a friend who knows some some greek and he was like well you know that's in the genitive or possessive case you know like apostrophe s or of and so that really skews the whole you know translation the whole meaning there and that's and that's what i think that was the most impressive verse to me that really got me to think no wait and also it's not just of course, of course witnesses think that we in that passage is just the anointed and so I guess, you know, everyone else who's in the great crowd gets left behind. They get to, be, they get to live on the earth, though, so that's okay. The the paradise earth, which, you know. Well, anyways, that's what's most impressive to me. It's like, wait, it's, how could, it's, it, to use an illustration, you know, like Nick, Nick or Rob, if I give you an old book and ask you to, you know, 
fix it up for me, you know, bind, rebind it and all that. And you burn the book and you just give me a Kindle with it as a PDF or whatever. You know, and I say, well, wh where's my book go? And I go, well, here it is. You re I re I replaced it. Well, I, I wanted to repair it. Uh, you know, it's like asking, well, re redeem flesh never to rise. How, how does that make any sense? Um, that, that, yeah. That was yeah. Awesome. You know, that was, I think, the most powerful ones. And, of course, there's other ones like uh, Philippians 3.21 or Paul and Peter's sure. speeches in Acts 2 and 13 about how, you know, his flesh never saw corruption. And I'm like, well, how could that make sense of, you know, he was raised up as an angel-like spirit being and God just vaporized his body. How does that make any sense? And yeah. yeah. Witnesses have an explanation for that. Basically, it wasn't a slow, gross, disgusting uh, corruption process. It was just instantly and somehow that <laughs> saves the day it's like well if i if i microwave something really quickly instead of you know cooking it over fire slowly i guess i didn't cook it after all you know uh there's there's other things to be said there but that, that, what really impressed me was wait then there's no two classes and there, there's other problems with that as well i mean it's even inconsistent from the witness perspective 823 because if you know what they think about the atonement their ransom view, Christ only gets back what Adam lost, but Adam never lost non-humanly lives. How come the anointed get released from their bodies by the ransom? But it's, I think most witnesses won't follow that logic, but I think it's sound. But I think they had a much more existential import was, wait, if Christ, there's no two classes, then wait, I'm not, well then, why, why, why is the organization saying only some people, like, you know, a few thousand now are born again? Like, well, that seems off to say the least. Yeah. And that, and that, and that had, you know, significant, I guess you say, you know, existential, ascetic, you know, import to me. And that was the you know, most uh, appealing, I guess the most repulsive air, but also the most appealing, one of the most appealing truths. Um, uh, again, from two, two different perspectives there. Yeah, well, even in that same passage of Romans 8 that you mentioned, if you go back to verse 11, uh, Paul says, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies yeah. through his spirit who dwells in you. So Christians who have the spirit of God in them now are looking forward to God giving life to their mortal bodies. So it's not that our mortal bodies are going to be, or the mortal bodies of the anointed class are going to be uh, just disposed of and replaced with spirit bodies, as Jehovah's Witnesses call them, but rather uh, they're going to have uh, their mortal bodies made fully alive in the resurrection yeah. just, and, and what's nice about this text is uh, Paul says that, that happened to Jesus before it happens to us. Yeah. So Jesus received uh, life in his body. His body was raised from the dead. His mortal body that died was raised from the dead. And God is going to give life to our mortal bodies uh, as well. And so when you, when you read that and then you go forward to verse 23, to me it's a very strong one-two punch against this idea oh, that yeah. there are two classes of believers. One is going to be in heaven as spirits, like uh, angel-like spirit beings uh, yeah. without physical bodies, and the rest are going to live on paradise earth, and they're going to be permanently separated, and they're never going to see God. Uh, so I guess that means they're they're not pure in heart because they're never going to see God. Yeah. You know? Matthew yeah, five like eight, uh, and uh, I like to call this uh, the city in the clouds uh, uh, eschatology. It's this idea of the the it, you know the uh, there's this comes up in, diff in several different science fiction uh, stories where there's the elite that live in the city in the clouds and it's pure and it's clean and it's pristine and it's white and it's bright and everybody's healthy and everybody's happy and everybody's, you know, great. And then there's, yeah, there's a Star Trek episode like that. Yeah. There's Thought a Star Trek minors. episode like that. There's, yeah, uh, it comes up several times in different science fiction uh, stories, but yeah, that's the, the it's the Star Trek one that I thought of first. But there's several of <laughs> these, and then everybody else is living on the Earth, and they're separated from all the the grandeur and the glory and the the neat, you know, uh, and pure uh, stuff. And th that is just not biblical eschatology. Revelation twenty one and twenty two teaches that 
we are going to be living in the presence of God forever and ever in the new heavens and new earth. Rather than an anointed class going up to heaven and living there forever, God, it says in Revelation 21, is going to pitch his tent among human beings. He's going to live with us in the new heavens and new earth. We're never going to be separated from him. We're going to know him. We're going to experience fellowship with God. And yes, this does have great uh, personal existential uh, hope to it, uh, the the hope of glory, the hope of an expectation of actually having a relationship with Almighty God, and having Him be this this loving Father who wipes every tear from our eyes and and who's with us. Uh, it, it's not uh, you know. Uh, up in the clouds away from us, looking down on us peons on the on the earth, but is actually with us and glorifying everything in in his presence uh, it 's a wonderful hope. The biblical hope is so much better than what jehovah 's witnesses are taught yeah it, 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 see, it seems to me the the paradise earth as witnesses teach it is more like a at best more like a like the Catholic notion of limbo it 's like well it 's it's okay. But if, but it, unless you're if you're missing out, you know this you this perfect immediate full union with God and even with Christ as glorified man too. Is, well, like what we'll, we'll can compare? It seems to me cre- witnesses make more of in, in everlasting life creaturely goods where they think most of our joy will come from. Well, we get to pet all these animals, and I'll say forget the animals. I want to. Well, God, of course, you know what you know the new heavens, new earth will rejoice in the the redeemed cosmos and all that. But it seems the prime, it's like the sun. The sun gives light to the moon. So any joy we get from the created cosmos is going to have to come from God. And we'll, be, we'll see him in his uh, full brilliance and glory. That's what, And that's what and I think if we can get this kind of this hope and yearning in the witness's mind, you know, I, I think that could be a powerful incentive. Because that was one of the most, of all the motivations and, and feelings I had, was the most uh, attractive even before I, you know, before I began to realize some of the, you know, the practical, personal, you know, implications of the doctrine of the Trinity and being caught up into the divine life of the Son, Father, and the Spirit, you know, that would appeal to me. Even even while I was a witness, even people would get comments like, "I uh, really, you know, what do you, what do you want most in everlasting life? Oh, I can build this cool house." And I'm like, "Well, I, well, I want to know God, and not just about Him, but you know, know Him." And that's that seems much more attractive than you know, cool. We get a say hi, you know, to you know, pet a zebra or whatever, you know, uh, as far as that goes. Yeah, I remember, you know, reading something online several years ago, a J.W. Prostate Glossary of Terms, meant to be humorous, and talk about this, the paradise earth thing says, where a bunch of second-class citizens are roared over by a bunch of people, people they didn't even like to begin with. Yeah, the uh, the Paradise Earth is uh, uh, it starts off with a apparently a thousand year cleanup operation. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's it's essentially uh, a kind of a uh, man made paradise where human beings are are going to be uh, living forever, uh, trying to clean up the mess of the past number of millennia, and they're doing it uh, without. Uh, enjoying the presence of God. That's that's a that's a very impoverished view uh, of uh, salvation. Yeah, and I, I guess it even somewhat relates to their corporeal understanding of God as well, because well, well God's in heaven. So, and of course, heaven and earth are rigidly separated. Of course, too, that also plays into it. Yes. God's in heaven; he can't be on earth with us. Well, that that couldn't be any. We will. And so I think it also plays shows another just how the, the ecosystem of various beliefs you know, interact, and ultimately, you know, a few like Aristotle said, you know, if an error in the beginning, a small error in the beginning, leads to you know pretty significant errors in the conclusion. Yeah, I have a I have a section in one of my uh, books on Jehovah's Witnesses that uh, the book is out of print now. It's in Understanding Jehovah's Witnesses, where I kind of go through how all of the different doctrines of the Watchtower are interrelated. And I, I start with uh, the, what really was kind of the foundational premise, I think, for Charles Taze Russell. There, there is no hell. Yeah. <laughs> and I say, if you start with that, from the, from the Jehovah's Witness point of view, 
uh, it's like a row of dominoes that fall uh, with just this one start. The, the hell is just the grave. It's not a place of eternal punishment. Uh, it's not, uh, e- you know, eternal condemnation. And then in their thinking, if that's true, then there's there can't be any uh, uh, soul that survives death. And you, you just the dominoes start falling. And, you know, by the time you're done, there's. There's no Trinity. Jesus isn't God. Salvation isn't by grace alone. All these things fall because it's all very closely interrelated. Well, I'd like to be able to keep this going. But guys, we've unfortunately reached a stopping spot. I've had a hunch that you two are going to be connecting with each other somehow to further talk about these issues, which is great. But we do have to start wrapping things up here. Um, Rob, do you have a blog, a website, an email where people can get in touch with you more, find out more? Uh, yes, they can go to our ministry's website, which is irr.org, or you can follow me uh, on my blog, which is Robert Bowman, that's B-O-W-M-A-N, Robert Bowman dot N-E-T. Mm-hmm. And do you have uh, any final words you'd like to leave today for the Deeper Waters audience? Uh, folks, please uh, support uh, Nick and what he's doing here. This is a, a great ministry. He brings in a lot of really great people, uh, present company uh, excluded uh, for modesty's sake, but mm-hmm. he brings in a lot of great people to uh, teach on various apologetics issues. So I hope people will continue to listen and, and support what he does. Okay, and now let's get back to you, Sean. Do you have a blog, a website, an email where people can touch you if they want about, more about you and your story? Um, I guess if you want to, I have an email I set up recently. It's uh, my, I begin to use more uh, my main email. It's, it's my name, Sean Kilaki, no spaces. And my name is S E A N, the correct way to spell Sean. Um, <laughs> see, hey, it's, it's true. So S E A N K I L L A C K E Y. So it's Kilaki, like kill the letter A C key. So it's, you know, oh, wait, oh, wait. And it's called my own name? No, that's right. Uh, so, Kilaki 2018 at gmail.com. You can ask some questions. Maybe I could help out uh, answering it that way. You know, anyone who's interested. And do you have any far- final thoughts you'd like to leave for the audience today? Um, well, you know, hey, I, well, first of all, I want to second uh, Rob's, uh, you know, the commendation on your uh, your blog and your podcast. I've always found it very, uh, well, not just like enjoyable, like from you know, an abstract sense, but like you know, you know, personal, challenging, and interesting, and uh, edifying as well. And so I say, yeah, if, if you if you guys are just new to his podcast, go back and listen to, to the older ones and to read his uh, blog posts. They're pretty, they're pretty great. Um, and uh, well, I just say, uh, just. Um, Oh, I'd love it. I'm not trying to, I'm, oh, lots of words, but I'm not trying to try to say. Um, I guess it was a, just, uh, if, if you're interested in witnessing to Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, just, just uh, you remember they're human too, and uh, don't get uh, too frustrated when they don't convert right away. It took me a while. Mm-hmm. Um, Amen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when you first started contacting me, you were still wondering about this whole Trinity thing, I remember. Yeah, yeah. See, uh, most, some, uh, a good number of the pieces were already putting in place, but it was still like the more of like, the, well, is it really true? Like, can I be really sure about this? Like, what about? Mm-hmm. And so I, that really helped about it. What about a year ago? A little, yeah, I think. Maybe mm-hmm. more. But, um, uh, yeah. Right, so, well, guys, I'd like to thank you for taking your time to come on the show, and hopefully we'll see you both back here again sometime. Well, thanks. It was Look great. Look forward to it. Uh, for now, I'd like to remind everyone that next week we're going to have Trimper Lowman on talking about the book The Lost Word of the Flood. For now, I am Nick Peters, and I am signing off.